Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, where it's our goal to help you become the best financial advisor possible and drive the positive evolution of financial advice. Hub24 is an ASX-listed company with over $15 billion funds under management and one of the fastest-growing platforms in the market. Neither a bank nor part of a bank, Hub24 focuses entirely on connecting advisors to a broad range of investment solutions for their clients. Discover why other advisors think Hub24 are the best in the market and access the benefits of choice and efficiency for you and your clients with their market-leaning managed portfolio solution. To find out more, visit hub24.com.au. G'day, g'day, how's it going? What do you know? Strike a light, Clayton here uh, with Roger from Blue Path, who I stumbled upon via reputation first. Wow. Yeah. Tell so me. I was uh, I was in the middle of the XY party tour, the Christmas tour, mm. right? So there we were. I, th- I was in Geelong and um, I'm chatting with a, a bunch of advisors and some of them mentioned you because you are, you know, at, at least according to them, right? Yeah. Was, knew quite a lot about sort of fiduciary and fascia and a lot of this sort of more technical stuff, which I'm a closet nerd for, right? So I love all yeah. this sort of deep and get, get into the weeds. And uh, they were saying, it was super interesting. So we tracked you down and I saw you, you were getting selfies with, you know, um, Stephen, Stephen, that's Stephen the, Gladfield. yeah, Gladfield at the, uh, the man at, at, at the, FBA, at the FBA. I saw you getting selfies. I saw you wrote the yeah. articles. <laughs> I thought I got to get this man on to chat. So, uh, no, thanks, thanks for coming on. No, oh, thank you very much for having me. Yeah. So, um, so if we, uh, let's start really high level. What does fiduciary yeah. mean? And am I even, Pronouncing it right. What yeah, does it mean? Yeah, f- fiduciary. Fiduciary. Yeah. And, fiduciary. And what does yeah. it and mean? I think that word puts off a lot of people. You just look at that and it just doesn't give anything away about what it means, right? Yeah. Uh, so that's just the term that was used historically to describe the relationship where someone's in a position of trust over someone who else who's uh, vulnerable. The classic was the trustee. So, you know, we all know what trust, trustees are. They are um, fiduciaries for the... Uh, the beneficiaries of the trust right. and uh, other fiduciaries are lawyers, solicitors are fiduciaries and um, also attorneys, of course, enduring powers of attorney are also fiduciaries. Yeah. So, okay. And, and general power of attorney, I guess, as well? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. So it's essentially, it's a position of power that requires a level of trust. Yeah. Would you say a dentist is a fiduciary? No. Okay. So here's a story. I went to the dentist and they tell me there's something wrong with my tooth. There's no pain. There's no problem. Then they sort of hack around with it and it creates a problem, right? So now I've now I've got to go get a, a root canal, right? Because yeah. um, as far as I was concerned, there was no problem, but now there's a problem isn't that a position of responsibility where I have to yeah, trust them? It's a position of responsibility and they owe you a duty of care. Yes. And they're a professional, so it's a high standard of of being a dentist yes. that they owe you. Uh, so that's a, a professional duty of care. So they can be you know, sued in negligence. Sure. Uh, not not that they will. They're actually fantastic. And, and they also the- they, they also have a certain degree of, of uh, confidentiality over your your records, right? They can't tell people your you know, your, your uh, uh, dental records. Yeah. Give those away to anybody. Yes. <clears throat> but they're not, they're not actually a fiduciary in the sense that they have to avoid a conflict of interest. But aren't they, due to capitalism, um, where if they source a problem, right, then they're paid extra money, right? Oh, so if they if, created a problem? Well, not so much if they created a problem because... Um, there, there probably was a problem there, but like, as in, isn't there sort of, and I'm just using this as a, yeah, no, it's a good one. It's a good one. Yeah. So, um, so So they're, they're they're fiduciary like doctors and dentists, but actually in Australia, doctors and dentists have been held not to be fiduciaries as such. Okay. Interesting. So they don't have to avoid conflicts of interest. 
Right, which blows my mind because, I mean, if they look into someone's mouth and they go, actually, this person needs a a, a filling, for example, yeah. you know, they get paid to diagnose that problem. So yeah. they're the one creating the business oh, okay. and yeah. then they're the ones fulfilling the need. Yeah. So There's I, an element of that in a fiduciary, yeah. But if you think about it, that goes for a lot of businesses. Absolutely. Uh, a mechanic. Builders, for example. mechanics, you're yeah. trusting them. Yeah. So there's amount of uh, there's amount of trust there for a a tradie. Yeah. Uh, and, and a lot of things there's amount of trust. And so that's definitely at the heart of my point. So how does fiduciary differ from right. all of those other ones? It differs from all of those ones because um, it's a, a higher level of selflessness required. It's a higher level. Yeah. So you you uh, may not. Uh, be in a conflict of interest and you may not exploit with fees. Right. Yeah. So like a mechanic or a builder, they can agree a fee with you and you're liable to pay it. But they're okay, always contractually. They're gonna find an extra oil leak and you know the the belt needs replacing or whatever, right? Yeah. So, so maybe one day they'll be regulated to that. They are regulated now, right, to a high degree. But if you agree a price with a builder, yes. If you if you if you if, uh, if there's no fraud, uh there's no misrepresenting on his part. There's all sorts of other legal protections in there for you when you're dealing with a mechanic or a builder. Right. Okay. That, that's and also great. a dentist and also a doctor because they've got, they've got professional obligations to you. So doctors and dentists have got a higher level of professional obligations to you than a builder or a mechanic. Right? Yes. But then you're, I guess what you're saying is with this fiduciary responsibility, it's even higher than... Yeah. Than, than than doctors and dentists. Yeah. Wow, yeah. that's really interesting. So where does it where does it come from? What's the history of because, it? Because because what's at stake, right? Let's look at a lawyer. If you go to a lawyer, that this is very important to you. It could be uh, representing you to, in a criminal matter. So they want to know that you are out to bat for them only, completely devoted to their interests, uh, and you're not you haven't got any any other things going on, which is going to compromise. The putting all of your skill, all of your devotion to that client. That's what you expect from a lawyer, right? Yes. Same, same with any kind of lawyer. So, uh, <clears throat> and it's so sensitive when you're in a combative, say, commercial situation. It's so so sensitive. The stakes are so high that you want the assurance that they haven't got any kind of thing going on, which which means they're actually not giving you their all and there's some suspicion that they're going easy on the other side because of some connection they've got with the other side. Right. So it's been held to be a very high level of um, <clears throat> selflessness and, and also so most people don't know the law supposedly, right? We, we don't know the law. So we're, we're in the hands of someone who could tell us things uh, just – Lie, lie to us if it, it, you know, ultimately we we probably have no way of knowing. I know that's analogous to a doctor, but the <clears throat> the combative um, adversarial side that's present in a in the legal um, fiduciary relationship uh, with the on the other side that's the higher stakes. Well, it's really interesting. Um, if you go back to the East Dutch India Company. Mm -hmm. And we say, okay, so that's the birth of the corporate entity. You might be able to tell me differently. That's as far as I'm aware. Um, but does the fiduciary responsibility go back to a similar time in history? Uh, precedes that. Pre precedes the, wow. uh, um, oh. the company, the limited company. But the limited company, of course, the directors are also fiduciaries. They're fiduciaries. To, to the shareholders. Actually, to the company. Huh. Uh, and 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 then, but not directly to the shareholders. But you say they've got a duty to the shareholders, but actually it's to the company as, as it happens. Right. That, I mean, uh, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So uh, and and so directors shouldn't be in a conflict of interest either. They get reasonable fees, but also they have to put all their services, you know, in in, uh, in service to the company. So the shareholders know these directors are going into bat for us. That's a really interesting mm -hmm. comment because conflicts of interest, if anyone does anything in life and they pull, you know, they bring with them a list of projects that they're a part of and things like that, typically there are conflicts, but then that, yeah. that, that's when sort of that declaration of conflicts on a register and making that public to the board and to the shareholders, that it becomes important at that stage, right? Yeah. 
So there's conflicts and there's conflicts, right? So if it, right. Uh, that's uh, actually behind a lot of the confusion uh, uh, with this term. So um, there's there's potential conflicts of interest, are things like uh, that, that that aren't re- recognised in law as a conflict of interest. So you know your relatives. So you were just you, you're in a uh, a meeting and you recognise one of the people on the other side or someone that you went to school with. Does mm. that mean there's a conflict of interest? No, <laughs> you know. So it, we're all connected. Yes. But the so the the law has uh, worked out. Well, what is a conflict of interest? What 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 do we actually need to protect versus what is just a, you know that's a theoretical rather than an actual conflict of interest. Right. right. And then if we tie that back to financial planning, we mm. and financial planners are fiduciary um, and and responsible to the needs of our clients. Yeah. What does that mean? Yeah. Well. So all, all of the jobs the, and these functions are all different, right? So lawyers are going to be different to trustees and so on. So uh, with your financial advisors, you've got, well, you, you can just go through a, a, a simple scenario, right? You go to a financial advisor and you, you're telling them stuff. So you want to know that they are going to keep that confidential. Yes. yes. <clears throat> and so on. Uh, and then when you start uh, telling them uh, information about your your wealth, you're really trusting them, and it could be that they could do something with that, right? So you you, you know that they it's not just a building job. It's not just giving someone your car. You're really laying up. You could you could have you know considerable assets, and they they could that could be useful to them. Mm. They could be able to make something out of that information. So there's that level of trust. And then there's the, well, you've got all the financial markets out there. There's this highly technical area, and I don't know much about it, but I'm putting my something big at stake, putting it in your hands. And the recommendations I want you, I'm expecting from you are that, it, that it's completely in my best interest that you're serving me. So you are, <clears throat> you're not going to put me into a product just because you are getting a fee from that that I don't know about. And that's your real motivation. So that's the conflict of interest. So that's your conflict of remuneration. Okay. So my, how... most of your financial advisor conflicts are to do with remuneration. Yeah, that makes sense. Because, I mean, I understand what you mean when you say if you go and start telling everyone what the private details of your clients, right? That's that's a pretty obvious, that's a pretty obvious one, right? Sure. And And, yeah. you know... But then how, if, if financial advisors are tied to this fiduciary duty, how did Timber Corp ever exist? How, how, how did these, how did these um, products that came through, how were they ever legal then from, well, from a product manufacturer point of view? Well, the product manufacturers, they don't owe you a fiduciary duty. Do they owe a duty to advisors to ensure that advisors are staying within the law? No. <laughs> really? Because advisors aren't vulnerable Un- sure. Unknowledgeable people. Sure. Yep. I understand. In, in principle. In principle. Yeah, I understand. Um, okay. So there's no responsibility from the product to the advisor. Well, they've got they've got legal responsibilities, right? They're not not allowed to misrepresent. Sure. Oh, they, for they, they, you know they, the, the, the basics yeah. for sure. But then from a from 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 this fiduciary duty, is there ever been time in history before, say, FOFA even? Where it was technically a no go, but it was just common practice. What do, we, what do you mean by no go? Let's talk about um, let's talk about receiving commissions before disclosure oh. of those of those commissions, right? So uh, in the early days, um, advisors were just earning commissions, and it didn't need to be disclosed. Yeah, I mean that went on. That was financial planning for many years. Yeah. So. How did that even exist? So they're new, new boys on the block, aren't they, financial advisors? Yes. Historically speaking, yes. trustees have been around Hundreds. for ages yep. uh, and lawyers have had their duties. So you know, the, the um, society's changed and it's become more complex and we didn't used to have financial markets and then we had share markets. And, um, of course, brokers aren't fiduciaries. So was there a time when this was unregulated by the common law? Yes, wow! Because these things grew up over time through custom. The common law followed business practices, 
So then in the 1700s, you had fiduciary duties recognized, at least from men and from uh, trusts. So in a matter of policy, you've got to have trustees who are above board, who aren't making a profit out of their role and not serving their the vulnerable beneficiaries. So that was established. And then you had your solicitors were established uh, under the same principle. And then financial advisors, whenever they started to hold themselves out as independent people who you could trust, and the suggestion was, or the, the outright offering was, that they would advise you independently, look out for your interests alone, and we don't have any relationship with the products that we're recommending, then they were fiduciaries. Huh. But the so, and that's been recognised in Australian law. Uh, of course, I don't know when, when was the first financial advisor. When did that grow up? I I don't know. But as, as soon as as soon as you ticked a number of boxes where the person was vulnerable and they were clearly relying on you, and that person had taken on an independent role of saying I'm going to advise you independently, then they were a fiduciary. Yeah. I, so potentially there was a time where advisors were filling that role, but for whatever reason, the common law just didn't, didn't cover them somehow. Well, they were, they were covered, but you, you say a, a lot of it's not adequate because you, what do you do if, if your fiduciary breaches the duties to you, what do you have to do? I have no idea. You've got to go to court, right? Right. And you've got to prove it. Right. So that's been a bit, bit of a problem with the common law in that you've got to, you have to go to court. The aggrieved party has to go to court and prove everything. And if they don't prove any part of it, then they fail. So it's risky. Litigation was risky. Ah. Because it was a simpler time. And, and of course, a lot of this worked by trust and you didn't have to go to court. It was the threat of going to court was there. Yes. But then as things became more complex, mom and pops started to get into the deregulated financial market. So the markets were uh, regulated, weren't they, until then? You know, consumers, Joe Average, didn't go into the market. That's so it's only when they started going in, because oh, this is a great thing that they can go into the markets, then you had hard luck stories of people who were being ripped off, given bad advice. So there's calls for pr- protection for this. And then uh, we well, can't expect this person who's lost all their money to then have to prove the, uh, um, that they were, there was a breach and uh, go through all those all that expense. Yeah. Um, so So then you had regulations come in. And the birth of ASIC and FOFA and the 10 years before FOFA, the FISRA, <laughs> um, where, where um, the, there was a requirement for disclosure. So you had to disclose everything. Yes. But, um, so, yeah. So the, the, the burden's obviously insanely higher than that now. Um, now we have legislated ethics, which is a really, really interesting scenario i think from any profession's point of view in any country's point of view so i don't know i don't know about that well i don't know i don't know whether it's insanely high an insanely high standard i think legislation it's more detailed well yes well uh but if you think about it we're actually we're really coming full circle back to the fiduciary principle and that's why i wanted to bring it up yeah that, that's that's what that's what we cover in our workshop you see uh why why look at the end product of a complicated corpse act when you when the corpse act is trying to trying to legislate some basic common law principles why don't you just learn the common law principles then you then you can read the corpse act and understand what it's getting at yes but the Cor- corpse act was a rules based approach and you know globally we're going we're moving from rules based tick boxes approach into principles based right so, right so we're really going back to principles if you like because the common law principles We've clarified certain areas. So we, what what the Corpse Act was very good uh, about was it, it said this is personal advice for retail clients. So it was a very it was clear demarcation of when you're in, in the gun as a financial advisor, <clears throat> and when you have to act for a client's best interest, right, or versus a wholesale client. So that was that was very useful. Uh, but the principles are the same. Common law principles. So just learn the common law principles. And uh, it's really hard to say that there's really any particular area where the common law uh, has been significantly exceeded in its level of, of care that's required. So you're, uh, so you're saying that 
which is pretty unique as far as I'm aware, having legislated ethics yeah. is probably more in line with our previous form of principle-based common law mm. than uh, the more modern style of tick box corpse yeah. act. Yeah. Well, that's a really interesting point of view. I, hadn't, I definitely yeah. hadn't ever considered that. Yeah, yeah. Some, some things are a little, have been clarified, but, what what's in the code of ethics, which is doesn't have an historical basis at least, or even really a strong historical parallel? That's what I would ask, and I don't really see too much. It's um, in 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 regards to the the fascia board. So you have consumers people on there. You have ethics mm. people on there. You have uh, you know, industry experts and, mm. and financial planners. I could imagine that would be a difficult board to run and to get an outcome. Yeah. Um, if you, Do you have an opinion in terms of what you would like to see as a methodology for interacting with advisors and the FASIA board? It, it, do, you, do you feel like there could be an efficient and effective way uh, to communicate? Obviously, um, Stephen said uh, when he was on here, you can go onto the website, right? So you can go onto the website yeah. and there's a contact us form essentially and yeah. you can submit via that. Do you, do you feel like that is a, an efficient way for the advisor public and yeah. the board well, to what, operate? What's the feedback been from people who have made submissions? When I did make one submission uh, on a couple of minor matters, but, uh, I, I didn't get the sense that people have been ignored. Uh, Stephen dealt with that in his in his speech at the FPA Congress, if you didn't hear that, and, and in the podcast. So. Yes. Yeah, I found it to be a pretty reasonable character. Yeah. There's a lot of, uh, you know, I wrote, the, I wrote this article, <laughs> 18 Misconceptions, just, just <laughs> if you can read that through. I mean, but I did try to be brief. Um, <laughs> That's a lot on of LinkedIn, miscon- by the way. That's for, for not LinkedIn. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of um, misconceptions out there. And, and I, th- I think it's like uh, it's it's akin to engineers and um, who who are building things in accordance with the the laws of Newton and <laughs> pretty strict laws. That's if, one. <laughs> if you don't know what the laws of Newton are and how engineers operate, then so the word comes out they're going to put a a, a big tower in the middle of town, or they're going to put a, put the structure over the the river, and you, and you say to yourself, that's never going to work. It's going to fall over, and, and you know death and destruction and everything's going to go wrong uh, and then, <laughs> then you learn to trust well engineers actually follow some some established principles yeah. that, uh, that, that they actually it'll be okay don't worry it'll be okay but you, you can't really satisfy people until the <laughs> the bridge is there and it's been there for 10 years uh so the co- the common law and these principles were developed by you know genius jurists of our of the common law you know? yeah uh, they they really suss these things out and they've proved uh, very robust, and uh, they haven't been tampered with. So this fiduciary, fiduciary concept is is one that's become it's uh, very very robust. So it's pro- it's protecting the consumer, yes, but not at the expense of the advisor. There's a there's a balance struck, and the the payoff is trust. Yes, which is what we're looking for. What you're looking for. Um, one of the things I thought was really interesting in terms of the. The, the 18 misconceptions, oh, yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> I, I keep thinking, there's a, there should definitely, what's that name of the film? It's like, you know, the eight things I hate about you or whatever like that, you know, 10 things I hate 10 about things. you. It's, there, it's yeah. always a round number, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Oh, so yeah. the 18 misconceptions, um, one of them was, uh, or, or at least you, you sort of address this where, one I mean, one of the big things, and it is a big thing, and I completely understand this, is that advisors are scared of being litigated against and your article sort of goes to some um, to some extent to it to say uh, lawyers like to be consistent yeah and it was lawyers that helped write this and so they haven't written it to open it up to right to to, to liability so yeah can you sort of duck into that a little bit because that's a key part of why yeah. advisors are, are have been yeah. Yeah, scared it's, about it's a bit this. like the engineers being constrained by Newton's laws. Uh, <laughs> right. So law, lawyers aren't, they're not taught to be creative. They're taught what the law is and the principles of it. Yes. And so they, it gets programmed into them. So they don't really depart from that. They, they clarify it and they might fill in a gap. Yes. That because 
society's changed somewhat, so there's something needs to be elaborated upon. But it's but but it's informed by the principle, historic principle. There's not much new in law. It's very conservative, and lawyers are wanting to, uh, wanting to be consistent with that. So the the code of ethics is consistent with the law. It, it, <laughs> That committee did not sit down and come up with a whole lot of ethics out, out of the blue. I, th- I think they it's written by lawyers. That code of ethics is written by lawyers. It's consistent with the common law. So relax. Right. ASIC came out hmm. and have offered to fill in some gaps as, as in terms of it was, it actually came out the day that I interviewed Stephen, um, where they said, for any shortfalls or misunderstandings, we're happy to sort of play a role in helping to explain mm. some of this. Can you give any more context to that press release? I thought they said that they were they would. So th- their territory is licensees. Yes. So it wasn't it about licensees? That they're, yes. they're saying well, in terms of the licensees, we're going to support licensees in uh, achieving these outcomes. Yeah, correct. Uh, and because being a little through bit through their relevant providers. Yeah. 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 So uh well, I think what I thought what they were saying is that the the code of ethics is aimed at advisors. So to the extent though that those uh objectives need to be <clears throat> will need some licensees to cooperate with that then we'll be in favor of su- of supporting the licensees. Sure. That's what I thought. Now, how are you with getting uh, put on the spot in terms of direct questions that I know advisors are still asking? Because this mm. was, so let me know if this sort of, if you have an opinion on this or not. Um, this is still a question that, that's getting asked and, and I know some licensees are agreeing and some are disagreeing. But one of the, one of the things that Steve and I discussed was referral fees, mm. right? So if you send business to company B and your company A, and if company B pays the advisor directly, it looked to be a conflict. But if the the company B paid the referral fee to company A, and then this then the advisor, as an employee, earned an additional revenue due to other aspects, and there wasn't a direct line, um, then it was potentially fine. It's not fine. It's still not fine. No, no, it's, 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 that's not fine it, because the employee relevant provider is receiving conflicted remuneration because because their remuneration uh, they're receiving a bonus or a volume based remuneration that uh, that's dependent on the referral to company A right but but as for so that that's that's consistent that's ne- that hasn't even changed really because that's the conflicted remuneration ban yeah uh, which Hain commissioner Hain um, approved of in, in in the report in the royal commission report so the, the, we should talk about that, the yeah. commission report, <clears throat> the effects of that. Uh, but as for payments between a company A and B, well, the Code of Ethics doesn't apply to the uh, that relationship. Yeah, it so, only applies to the relevant provider, otherwise yeah. known as an advisor. Yeah, but that could be still a conflicted remuneration under the Corpse Act. Hmm. It's just that the, the, the Code of Ethics has only got scope as, as applying to advisors. Yes. So it's, it, there's nothing really, a, there's no big loophole there as far as I can see. Mm. Yeah, it's a tricky one because then, you know, how, how deep does a JV relationship have to extend yeah. to be able to not be a referral fee but rather a sharing of business? Yeah. So this is the practicality thing. Like everything's a conflict in some way, but we're all earning. Yeah. We all have to make a crust in some Correct. way. So, so you're, you're drawing a reasonable line on, on what a client would feel is not on sure in terms of backhanders that they don't know about yeah it's and and i i fully understand the purpose of mm. it right i fully understand that um you you want to stop you know advisors being able to do the classic sort of stick them all in smsf pump it full of the the off the plan uh, properties that you know the, the same so i absolutely understand the concept of what it's trying to solve um it's that's the piece that i no one disagrees with it's Mm. the piece that your mate that shares a table in the office with you that you've worked for 20 years with and he does a great job with your clients and he he gets mortgages um for really good price and 
yeah, it's it's stuff like that that uh, that unfortunately just doesn't really cut the mustard, so to speak. Mm. Um, I'm not sure what you mean there. So, so for example, let's say I was a financial planner, you're a mortgage broker, mm. we share a, an office together, mm. and for the last 20 years, you've got my clients really good mortgages and taken care of them and made me look fantastic as an advisor, and together we've looked after hundreds of advisors. Yeah. Um, but you're in a different business. But yeah. we're in a different business, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm AB financial planning, is your CD mortgage broking. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that... That's seen as a conflict. To me, that's just yeah. that. Well, if, I, if, I, I if, feel if like the that. Cli- if the client's paying that, if paying the fee, then that's excluded from conflicted remuneration. So it's only the it's only the the secret commissions, the backhanders, yeah, that are being outlawed here. So your your, your client gets referred to me as a mortgage broker. I do that. And by the way, his fee, uh, Roger's fee, is a uh, hundred dollars. Uh, so you charge that, and, and, and so that's that's not so conflict if remuneration. It's, if it's declared, if the you de- paying it, right? So if you declare mm. to my client that I'm getting twenty percent of that money, then we're all above board. Yeah, and on on, on the invoice that goes to them, on the uh, that's a line item which says what well, the payment that they're making to me in effect it doesn't have to be sure strictly directly to me. Yes, as long as they're paying it. I understand. And would that still be the case if it was a commission earned via the mortgage? No. Yeah. I don't okay. think so. That's tough. So so it's I mean it's, that's I guess they're the them those situations that I'm describing are it's far. compromise it's a compromise, isn't it? I mean you let's say take let's take it back to your dentist example. Yes. Um you're in the dentist, he says you've got a problem here, I need to send you to a specialist. Yes. Uh it's refers you to the specialist and uh, doesn't tell you that he, he's getting five percent, right? No, you, you, that would be no, that wouldn't be on, would it? Well, I I don't doubt that it happens. Uh, no, I don't know. They don't get anything. They don't get anything. No, okay, no, they can't get that. That's unethical. So you want to know that the referral to that specialist is completely in your interests. I'm not. I'm not tainted with this uh, relationship here. I, I send people to. To someone who I don't actually think is very good, but I, uh, I'm, I'm getting five percent. So. <laughs> well, yeah. So there's there's no there's no specialist get a kickback like that. Doctors don't get a, a kickback for referring you to surgery, right? Mm. Lawyers don't get a kickback from the barrister. You refer sure. you to the, the, okay. these things are above board. So that's yeah, that's, yeah, that's yeah. what you it would bring it into that that sphere. I mean, myself personally, as an advisor, I I didn't do any sharing of payment. I, right. Yeah. It, um, and I know a lot of advisors that don't. Um, yeah. It's in. It's still. I, I know. I've I, got a lot of sympathy for it. I, I really because I, I I went I I was advised many years ago. I I started say I wasn't saving any money, <laughs> spending my money, and they said, "Why don't you go into this product and um, put in this much per month of your salary and." And I didn't ask what they were getting. They didn't charge me anything, but I knew they were getting something. But I didn't really, I didn't really, I sure. wasn't really interested. I, yeah. I, I didn't mind. Yeah. Uh, but that's just the way it went. But that, that's a, it's a, an easy example, isn't it? Where it's not really a problem. And I, I was happy to pay them out of my earnings because I guess, I guess it felt like I wasn't paying them anything because yeah. I never saw it. So it's, yes. a, it's one of these fallacies, thinking fallacies, right? Cognitive yeah. uh, fallacies. So, uh, but but actually, it's not really fair, is it? That uh, I, I was not being told. I've since been told. You'd be amazed what they were getting. Uh, really, oh, I didn't want to know. <laughs> but it, it got me saving. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good point. Yeah. So essentially, kick. You know, if you call them kickbacks, that has been the way that this industry has run right from for so long. From a product to licensee level to a licensee to an advisor level to an advisor to other professions level, it's it's mm-hmm. almost like um, every it, it's how the business has been run, mm-hmm. um, and even now, still to this day, there there is um, insurance commissions, right? So an, an insurance advisor will still get a commission based on the yeah. insurance that 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 they declare. Um, walk me through how. An insurance commission is still allowed under this fiduciary duty. Well, it was a carve out, wasn't it? And uh, uh, insurance insurance salespeople were not fiduciaries; they were agents of the insurance company. So they weren't fiduciaries; they weren't financial advisors. 
When was this decided? Well, they've never been. They weren't historically. I can tell you right now yeah. that it's insurance planners consider themselves financial advisors for sure. Oh, they, well, these days, yes. Yes. Yeah, these days. Uh, so, but they, they pleaded um, to to the FOFA inquiries. So they, they said we're, we're an exception because we've always operated this way. Yeah. Right? So and they, they got an exception, but uh, the... Uh, the commissions have been regulated and equalized, right? Yeah, so they're, they're all standard. That's fair. So that, that, that's taken out the, the temptation to recommend one product over another. Yeah, yeah. It was kind of, it was, it was a little bit crazy. I remember um, it's kind of interesting because I got into financial advice via tax accounting. And uh-huh. so I was very used to meeting with people. They pay a fee. It's all, you know, la-di-da. Uh, and then I went to uh, Dixon Advisory, and back in the day, that was quite a good name, and um, uh, sort of spent a, a year there, and it, I was in the SMSF sort of SIS team, was just, so we only really dealt with the uh, advice, didn't touch the investments, and didn't touch insurance, and so it was all fee-for-service, and um, I remember learning about commissions, Oh, and I guess I was maybe like in my fifth year of working in finance in one way or another. Hmm. And I remember it was kind of weird because I was, I was like, okay, so rather than just charging a fee, you get someone to pay for something else and then they pay you. Hmm. Um, it was kind of a, coming at it from a, a, a long way around rather than getting brought up into it. It was actually... It was a mindset that I had to get my head around right. to, to start doing rather than um, it being a natural and easy part. And, yeah. and so I, I definitely think the new advisors that are coming through that aren't exposed to commissions in any way, I don't think are really going to struggle with it. I think it's mm. sort of normal. Um, but with the insurance commission, I told, I've always found it to be an interesting thing because I totally understand the counter argument which is well who's going to pay for Mm. someone to do their insurances and i'm sure there would be some level Mm. of people that were doing it but it's such an unenjoyable topic (laughs) (laughs) that that if we talk about the fallacies before logical fallacies Mm. this may not be a logical fallacy but you could call it for lack I of think, a better term, I think it an is, emotional It's, it's one of those cognitive yeah. fallacies, yeah. Yeah, uh, where, where, where people just don't want to Yeah, I think they call it the, 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 the maths accounting fallacy. Right. Where, so people have an account that they, the, the college account sort of thing, uh, um, or the, uh, the holiday account, so they won't touch that. Oh, but mate. meanwhile, they're in, they're in racking up credit card debt. So yeah. it's, it's, it's irrational, it's highly irrational, but you don't want to touch that. Uh, and people would rather pay something and 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 then so a cut comes out of that that they don't really know about rather than have to actually hand over the cash for a service you yeah. can understand that yeah, yeah. So, but there were the insurance objections are really based on when you say well who's going to pay for that well it's, they're paying for it anyway right so they want it's just a different not. way of paying for it which it was, commissioner hayne has said that he wants <laughs> wants everyone to to charge like that because that's how everybody else gets charged in the world we've kind of reached a consensus that you charge for your time and your skill yeah based on if not time then some kind of tangible reward Let, let's stuck into that because you mentioned before we should um uh, sort of bring it up yeah. so commission hayne you've got the royal commission what were your takeouts yeah, well, the the point I wanted to make on that because there's a lot of a lot of takeouts, right? <laughs> the, the point I wanted to make there uh, is that um, so he, he what did what did he say when he reviewed all the the terrain? What did he say? He said he said he finds conflicted remuneration ban is it's okay. He, he thinks it, it's it aimed at the right things. It's just all the exceptions he wants phased out. So uh, the 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 idea of um, payments not influencing your product recommendations one over the other i think that's a good idea so fazio have read the commission report right and they're saying well we how do we preserve that mm. that's been approved so hence in standard seven we have they the, have the accept um as specified in the corpse act so the that ban has been preserved so 
Uh, he's all, Commissioner Hayes also said he doesn't like conflicts of interest. That's not working. The the ban's not working. So what what does Vassia do? They put in a conflict of interest prohibition, but at the same time they need to preserve the conflict of remuneration ban. And 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 also, so the things that conflict of remuneration doesn't ban have to not be conflicts under the code of ethics. What is, what does that mean? Well, that means that payments are okay if they're not conflicted remuneration. Right. So and and so what the, what they've gone into and just added to this though so Commissioner Haynes said there's still a conflict even if you if even with the conflict of remuneration ban there's still a conflict of interest which hasn't been effectively prohibited which is there's a the temptation to recommend a change or a positive action rather than do nothing. Yes. Rather than stick with the yep. cause of action. So yep. conflict of remuneration doesn't doesn't address that problem. Yeah. So uh, what FASI have had to do is they want to ban conflict uh, ban conflicts of interest, but preserve conflict of remuneration uh, and the things that aren't conflict of remuneration. So they've they've really expl- uh, they've already gone into well, and this is lawyers have done this. What is it that conflict of remuneration is really banning? And what it's banning is that a any sort of payment which is, creates a temptation. That, that a disinterested outside observer would reasonably say is likely or could induce a breach of the best interest duty. So they've just rephrased this, and it looks complicated, and then their latest guidance, they've got a page and a half on that. On that. And then they're finished off with, and by the way, no recommendations which are clearly uh, not reasonable compared to sticking with the, the existing course of action or doing nothing. So... Yeah, because obviously, traditionally, one of the problems has been if someone's in a low cost ETF, like a low cost, say, industry super fund, and, and, you know, they've got less than uh, $100,000, and someone's recommending an SMSF or something like that. Um, I wish they'd kind of like call out the more problematic scenarios oh, yeah. like what i just mentioned so yeah. um if you're recommending uh, actually i believe that there has been a minimum stuck uh, or a clear well they've got like 30 examples in their october guidance right as he's put in so you know if you write to them they might put one in okay yeah that's a really good point well, so what, what is the what is that case that you well, yeah, I mean, just moving into self-managed super funds a little bit too aggressively, yeah. you know that 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 that's a that's a clear one. Um, putting people into you know property that from an investment company that you or that that the that the financial planning company has a, has an association with or an ownership yeah. in, you know, th- those kind of ones are the um, are the well, really one, one of the uh, case studies in the in the code of ethics explanatory statement uh, was an SMSF. Sort of train wreck. Yeah, you've read those. Yes, the... that's why they're now saying sort of yeah. closer to five hundred thousand, where traditionally it was around two hundred thousand dollars to recommend an SMSF. I've seen five hundred thousand right. get mentioned quite a bit more right recently. Right. Um, so um, without sort of you know going into detail into just the stuff that you talk about at your workshops, um, one of the things that I've paid attention to in terms of, you know, financial advisors, uh, especially on the XY platform, is a lot of people love to get training, right? And I was actually talking about it with someone just at lunch. They said, do you think a lot of people are going to leave by the end of the year with the test? And I said, well, the test is, you know, it's got a pretty high pass rate and I'm sure if you do a little bit of training, um, there's an even higher chance that that you'll get through but say 2024 in in regards to doing a, a degree yeah I, I think that's we'll, we'll definitely see a a large even in the xy uh community which i think is two-thirds mm-hmm. give or take um our from what we can tell probably around two-thirds of people have a degree which is higher than the the general um, advice population but still, that's one third of people that need to still get a degree, and and we we have no idea as to whether that's even a, an appropriate degree. So, mm. I think probably in the next couple of years we'll see. 
I think that will have a bigger drop off. But do you think there should be advisors out there that are leaving because of the FASIA exam? Well, not because of the FASIA exam, no. No. Yeah. Uh, and like, like you say, I think you can cram for it. You can do a course. Uh, and if what, what I've uh, observed through our participants is that the, the older, more experienced advisors, they actually know this stuff. They, they do consider the broad long-term interests of their clients because they've been they, living it. They've, they've been, been living, living it. The repercussions. They, yeah, they've oh. been living with the repercussions, and they have amazing relationships with their clients. And uh, so, and they, they, uh, I think we all agree that people who don't have the life experience. I mean, how do you do that? How do you ask someone that what What are you going to do? What do you want to do? Have you thought yeah. about what happens if you die? I don't know. These are really very confronting questions, and uh, they are they're more experienced, older advisors. They've they've done it, so they yeah. kind of learned how to do it, if you like. So it's a yeah. it's a tough job. It's a tough job, and I think you can parallel it again to other professionals where you you got to learn at the foot of somebody else and learn the questions they ask and so on. What was the question again? <laughs> uh, well, well, the degrees? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, yeah. first of all, do you I, think I, anyone I, should leave because of the exam? And then, do you? And what do you think will happen? So, with, look, with the... look, if you if, if you can't pass the exam by uh, doing the reading, doing a course like ours, um, uh, then you know, you should be able to pass it. You should you should pass it. The feedback I've got is that the exam is actually not bad. Yeah. It's it's it, it does. Uh, it's, it's got a, a good correspondence with with what it's supposed to be asking, um, and uh, so it's, it's fair uh, that that's what I've heard. So, uh, and the code of ethics isn't really such a it's hard, it's hard to fault it really. Unfortunately, you have to have to learn all the disclosure stuff which came in two thousand and one. And then you've got to learn FOFA because this is all in, still in place under the Corpus Act, and you have to learn. So that's made it a bit more difficult. But mm. um, yeah, there's a lot of regulation, um, but the, you, you can you, you can learn it. Yeah. As for degrees, uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't I don't know why this might be a bit controversial, but no one's been able to explain to me why you have to do uh, an ethics course in addition to this FASIA exam. I don't know why you, why you have to do that. Lawyers don't have to study ethics. Yeah, they they, they do they do an exam, uh, but they're not studying the theory of ethics. You know, the deontological theory versus the utilitarian. Yeah. Uh, why do we have to do that? In, in fact, it's it's actually all in the common law. <laughs> you know, so I, 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 I don't understand that, but maybe someone will explain it to me. Um, where do you see advice? in let's say five years from now <laughs> yeah. uh, I, th I think it'll be a, um, I, I think everyone will be passing through and there'll be increasing levels of trust I, I, I do and uh, I think people will be marketing themselves with confidence and, and providing value and you'll be doing well that's what I think yeah because yeah. there's, as far as I'm aware, there's all the super funds coming available, money coming available. Uh, no one, no one else can advise you. It's it's legal, right? It's not like you have competition. You don't. It's a it's a closed shop. If you're advising, giving financial advice, then you have to do this, and no one else can do it. So people do need financial advice. You know, if I if I won the lottery. <laughs> I would yeah. go to a financial advisor if my wife wasn't a financial advisor. <laughs> Is your wife a financial planner? Yeah. Fantastic. Please tell me yeah. she passed the... Uh... She passed, yeah. <laughs> she said passed. So she's my... Uh, we we co-present the workshop. So, Fantastic. Yeah, so she brings that perspective and I bring the ethics law perspective. Well, you know, to, mm. to, to wrap up our conversation, tell us about what you got going on. Like, uh, we, I yeah, mean... We, you... we run a day-long workshop yep. um, covering all the FASIA curriculum. Uh, including practice questions from the FASI exam, and uh, we equip people to pass the exam. Yeah, awesome. What's the uh, what's the website? Bluepath.com.au, and it's all there. You can register on there. We run uh, workshops in the major centres in the weeks leading up to each exam. Um, wave. Well, like I said, yeah. I heard uh, really good things before I ever had the chance to meet you, uh, and then read about much. what you were doing online, and then seeing the. Uh, 
the selfies. So uh, <laughs> mate, congratulations on the impact that you've already had on the industry. And um, yeah, let's, uh, let's stay in touch. Thanks, Clayton. Thanks, Bill. Cheers. Cheers.